still playing that night, did he? <laughs> there he is. At the Petty, it's 10 30. Five, four, and three. Two, one, <coughs> Tuesday. Very cool. 10 30. It's already on. All right, good morning. Glad to see everyone. We welcome you to a, another Sunday morning of Jesus and James. Uh, Glenn was just sharing uh, some, some great news. Uh, well, not the best news, but. Uh, some good news about his brother. We were play, praying for his brother uh, a few weeks ago uh, concerning uh, some co uh, cancer, uh, prostate cancer. And even though he does have the, the cancer, it's, it's not the, the worst uh, case. And so we want to continue to, to pray uh, for Glenn's brother. And tell me his name again. Scott. 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 And so please uh, keep Scott in your prayers. And um, he watches us uh, via the internet. And as well as many folks do, uh, our, our congregation is growing here via the internet. So I want to welcome everyone that uh, may be joining us uh, through uh, Sermon.net and through our, our streaming abilities. Uh, we, we do every week. But we're very, very honored to uh, have you join us and uh, very honored to have you folks here with us this morning. And uh, it just always amazes me, you know. We, we do this every week and you guys keep showing up. <laughs> we're going to do uh, we're, we're going to be in the in the book of 2nd John which is uh, a real short uh, book of the Bible and uh, but a very powerful one and uh, the, the, even though the book is short the message will still be uh, about the same length <laughs> When one of the things you don't want to do is give me plenty of uh, lateral room there to talk. Because I will. <laughs> but we're glad to have you. My name's Teddy Baker. My wife Jan is here with us. Uh, we always thank uh, Sandra and Jim Penner for donating the facilities here to uh, at the Cottage Vineyards to, to have this service. It's always an honor again to do it. We're going to do uh, a couple of praise songs today. One is uh, one of the more contemporary, older praise songs that's been around for a long time. And, and then the second is a, a very traditional hymn. And the, very, the second song has a lot of these and thous and didst and the old King James style language, you know. And, and I want to encourage you today, don't let that, don't let that throw you. Don't miss the message of the, of the song because it uh, has a very powerful message. This first one here is... Uh, one of the first praise songs I learned, it goes something like this. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you've been my life. So glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. I'm dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I live. Lord, I lift your name on high. 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 
Living for Jesus, a life that is true. Striving to please Him in all that I do. Yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free. This is the pathway of blessing for me. Oh, Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee. For Thou and I atonement didst give myself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be thy throne, my life I give, it's forth to live, O oh Christ, for thee alone. Living for Jesus, who died my place, bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer His call. Lord and Savior, I give myself to Thee, for Thou in Thy atonement didst give Thyself for me. I own no other master, my heart shall be Thy throne. My life I give, it's forth to live, O oh Christ, for thee alone. Give the Lord a praise. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We ask your blessings on our service. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to come together in these North Georgia mountains and to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, our heart's cry today is to help us to live for you. To help us to live lives that are worthy of our calling just as your scripture tells us. That we be mindful of your presence in our life and your presence in the world. Help us to see where you're working, Father. And then God, give us the courage to join you there. We love you, Lord. We thank you so much for every single day that you give us. We continue to pray for our brother Scott and just pray your healing touch that you would work through the doctors and through the treatments. God, we don't care if you use medicine or miracles. We just pray for healing in his body. We thank you for our brother Glenn that, that uh, he comes in and is a part of this. Like so many others, God, that, that you have drawn to this place. Father, we never take that for granted. We give you the praise and the glory for what you're doing here in us and through us. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Well, you know... <clears throat>
You know it's time to resume either running or walking when you try to do a few push-ups <laughs> and you can't <laughs> and discover that there are some certain body parts that refuse to leave the floor <laughs> you get winded just saying the words 10 kilometer run <laughs> you come to the conclusion that if God really wanted you to touch your toes each morning that he would have put them somewhere around your knees. <laughs> you analyze your body honestly and decide that what you should develop first is your sense of humor. <laughs> you step on a talking scale and it says, come back when you're alone. <laughs> Well, the question today is, how's your walk? Because that's what we're going to talk about today. Our walk in this world. What does that look like? What is it all about? How should we walk? So the question is, how's your walk? Is it pretty wobbly? Is it smooth? Is it fast? Is it slow? Obviously, there is more than one kind of walk. We can physically walk, and that's good. They say that walking is one of the best exercises there is for your heart, for your lungs, for your overall health. Walking is healthy. Spiritual walking is also very healthy. Very healthy for all of us to do and spiritual walking really is the best yet first Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 through 10 I want to read what it says it says have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives tales rather train yourself to be godly for physical training is of some value but godliness has value for all things holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. And First Timothy goes on to say that this is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That's why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God, it says, who is the Savior of all people and especially of those who believe. The Bible talks a good bit about walking with God. In the first book of the Bible, in the Garden of Eden, God and Adam walked together each day. That was part of why God created us, was to be in fellowship with Him. So the Bible says that they commune, they walked together, they talked together, they shared time with each other. There's a story of another man in the book of Genesis that walked with God. His name was Enoch. Did you ever hear of Enoch? Enoch has a, a very interesting story. In Genesis 5, uh, verses 21 through 24, it says, When Enoch had lived 65 years, I want you to grab a hold of this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm 64, did I tell you that? So like in January when I turned 65. You gotta be Enoch. Well, so I'm right up there with Enoch. So I want you to listen to what Enoch is doing. You think you guys are too old? Well, I'm just too old to do anything. I'm just, you know, I'm retired. I'm, you know. Ugh. Let me share you with, with you what Enoch did. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Now, Methuselah was like the oldest dude in the Bible. <laughs> and after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Well... <laughs> all 
altogether, Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. Then he was no more because God took him away. I've always envied Enoch. And, and not because God took him so that it, he wouldn't experience death, but because of his close walk with God. Can you imagine that kind of walk? Can you imagine the communion, the fellowship, the talks that he had with God? We really can't because it's, it's difficult because none of us have had that type of an experience with God. Or so it seems. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan was a great pastor for many years, wrote uh, many great books and, uh, about being a pastor. And in a sermon that he had called Enoch Walked with God, Dr. Morgan gave the following illustration. He said, a little child gave a most exquisite explanation of walking with God. She went home from Sunday school and the mother said, well, tell me what you learned at Sunday school. And she said, well, don't you know, mother, one day they went out for an extra long walk and they walked on and on until God said to Enoch, you are a long way from home. You had better just come in and stay. And he went. Can't tell you how many times uh, in, in, in services that I've done been called on. I used to be a, a pastor on call when I lived in South Carolina for a, a local funeral home. And I used to do services for people that had no pastor or weren't connected to a church anywhere. And I love doing that because I love telling this story about Enoch. Because that is part of how God comes to us, I, I believe, in the Spirit. That as we get ready to step into eternity, the Lord Jesus is there to walk with us. And just like Enoch, God looks at us and says, you know, we're a little closer to my house tonight than we are to yours. Why don't we just go stay at my house tonight? I love that picture of God. I love that picture of the Lord walking with us and escorting us into eternity because I don't fear the death I fear the dying part you know the pain what it's going to be like but that walk with the Lord I don't worry about so much <laughs> I can't wait to see his hand extended but that walk is not just the walk into eternity the walk is is very real for us today. And, and what a great walk that, that God and Enoch had. Again, would that we all had such a great walk with God. In the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 10, it says, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to have a reverence, that doesn't mean be afraid of Him, but to have a reverence for the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and to observe the Lord's commands and decrees that I am giving you today for your own good. Walk in all his ways. Yep, that's what we need to do. We need to put our heart and our soul into this walk. It's not a run. It's not a sprint. The Bible calls it a walk. And we are to walk with God. And John's message in 2 John is clear about the life that we should live. First, he says we must walk in obedience. Second, we must walk in love. Third, we must walk in truth. That's what I want to talk about today. How do we walk? Well, first the Bible says that we should walk in obedience. 2 John 4, beginning with verse 4, says it this way. John is, is writing, he begins the, this book writing, and he, it seems like he's talking to a lady. 
and, and, and addressing her family. And there are two ways to take this book. You either take it literally or you take it figuratively. And if you take it literally, then John was writing to a lady at a, somewhere in her family. I, I take more of, of a figurative approach to the scriptures. I look at it as John writing to the church. Writing to the church, talking about the children of the church, the, the congregation, the people. And he's writing to them to give them basically the same warning that we talked about last week. That there's been this uprising of new teachings, false teachings. Gnosticism it was called, which is more like our modern day New Age movement. And John is saying, John is, is over the churches, as I shared with you last week, he's over the churches of Asia Minor, which today is modern day Turkey. And so there's been this uprising of false teachers who have been redirecting, detouring believers off on new understandings of what the Bible was about and what God was about and what the life, death, resurrection and the ascension of Jesus was all about. And so John writes in, in the beginning in verse 4 it says, It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love. That we walk in obedience to his commands. He says, some of your children are walking in the truth. And the truth is, not every person who claims Christ as their Savior walks in the truth or walks in obedience. Many people believe the truth. They believe the truth of the Bible. They don't obey the truth of God's Word. I struggle with a lot of those areas. Some will obey, but not everybody will obey God's Word. And then he says in verse 6, And this is love, that we walk in obedience to His commands. Obedience to His commands. Wow. What a tall order. Do you like buffets like the Golden Corral? <laughs> or Ryan's? Most people do. But do you eat everything on the bar? I doubt it. I try. <laughs> but I don't eat everything on the bar. I, I, I'm sure that some of you are as selective as I am. Because a, a lot of times, you know, for example, I think the salad is okay. I love salads. But I like to get over there where the meat and potatoes are. Because like the Golden Corral, sometimes they have prime rib. Yummy. Fried shrimp. I could eat a million of them. But I'm selective. I'm selective at, at the buffet, and the reality is you are too. What we do at the buffet, we also do with God's buffet, spiritually. We do with God's buffet when it comes to His commands. His commands are many, but we often pick and choose what we like, what we want to do, instead of trying to do everything that God's commanded us to do. For example, here, here's a command that that we, we I think we struggle with. We do real good with the first part of it. In fact, a lot of our ministry is based on this, especially the, the giving portion of it. James 1.27 Religion that our that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. We're talking about religion that God accepts. 
It says to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Well, my opinion is that, that we at, at, at Jesus and Jeans, we, we do a great job on the first part of this. That's what we do on, on an annual basis with all of the offering that you guys give. You know, and we never ask you for money. We, we, we make it about as difficult to give as we possibly can. We have a little box up there with a plastic knife that you have to shove stuff down into. Because, you know, I tell you, I tell you all the time, I don't want you money. I, I take no compensation. Jan and I take nothing for this. You know, and, and I've told you before, you only wish I wanted your money. I, I don't care about your money. I want your heart. Amen. That's what I want. Not for me, because that's what Jesus wants. And when Jesus controls that inner being, that part, I don't want the muscle in your chest. Yuck. <laughs> I, I want that inner being... <clears throat> You know, to be changed from the inside out. And the only way that can happen is through the power of the Holy Spirit. But you guys wanted to give anyway. <laughs> like, okay, so, all right, so what do we do? So I said, well, okay, let's do what the Bible says. Let's give to widows and orphans. And so every year around Christmas time, and last year Bobby and Don were so gracious, wonderfully found a, a wonderful family that we were able to help. And so we gave every dime. And they never see it coming. And we're not out there proselytizing. We didn't say, well, if you come to our little worship service, we'll, you know, we'll help you. No. I told her, if I never see you again in life, it's okay with me. Because I want you to be touched by Christ. What we do is we're just that extension of the Lord. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. And so we do a great job on that. And it says also that the, the rest of the year, we also need to remember the widows in their affliction and in their loneliness. Maybe you're connected to people like that. The second half says to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. How do you think we do in that area? Mm. <laughs> Let me be the first to say <laughs> that I struggle <clears throat> with this half of the verse. It showed up last night <laughs> when I was watching Clemson. <laughs> I lost my witness about 11.30 last night. <laughs> He got it back, though. But I got it back because they won. <laughs> but it, it, it really, the world we live in, it's almost like the air that we breathe. The water that we drink. There, there are pollutants that are constantly in our air and in our water. So how, how do we avoid them? We avoid them through the filters that we use, either through our water or through air filters in our homes. And really, that's, that's what God's Word represents. It, it represents the filter that we allow our walk and, and the ways of this world to be filtered through God's Word and to be able to impact our lives in a very positive way. Does that make sense? Because what else do we have? You know, just a, a, a good moral understanding of, well, he's a nice guy. She's a, a nice lady. They're nice. But if we don't have anything to filter niceness through, that, that can be misrepresented as some type of belief system. Well, they're nice people. And we need more than just being nice. We need, we need some guidelines. We need some boundaries that we can live in. And God says, here they are. It's called the Bible. 
Read it. Understand it. Spend some time in it. It's a great filter. It'll help you filter out all the other stuff. Here's another command that we prefer to overlook and not do. James 1.26 says it this way. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. We don't like to keep a tight rein on our tongues. We like to talk. Talking gets into gossip. I never will forget being on staff at a church, and you know, I'd have people come up and say, "Well, Pastor, I, you know, I, I, I just wanted to share as a matter of prayer <laughs> what I heard was going on in a certain area. Now, not gossiping, just as a, I just want to share." And I go, "Well, don't do that." <laughs> I don't want to hear something that you heard about. I don't want secondhand information. If I don't have first-hand information, I don't want to hear about it. It's gossip. It's your opinion of what somebody else said. And you know, have you ever done that thing where you sit in a room and you start a story over here and it goes around the room, and by the time it gets back around to you, the whole story's completely changed? What were we talking about? I don't know. Started over here, ended over here. And it's not the same story. We often just say whatever comes to our minds. We don't filter our tongues sometimes. It says, what's on my mind comes out of my mouth. Oh. <laughs> Always. <laughs> We, and, you know, it's learning to filter that stuff. <clears throat> and, and a lot of times we don't worry about whether it's offensive or not. Mm. You know, it just comes out. You know, and the Bible says, hey, it's okay to speak the truth. But the Bible says speak the truth in love. <laughs> you know, don't just let me, you know, upchuck on you right here, you know, with, with my opinion. I guess ugly in a hurry. I once read uh, the story uh, that happened on New Year's Eve. This was in, in the year of 2010. There's a comedian. Her name is Kathy Griffin. And she did a no-no. Well, actually, she said a no-no. And the news item read, this was in the news. It says, comic Kathy Griffin rang in 2010 by dropping the F-bomb live on TV during CNN's New Year's Eve broadcast with anchor Anderson Cooper. Now, I didn't watch it or hear about it. I don't even know where I was in 2010. <laughs> but if, if you've ever seen Kathy Griffin on TV, especially maybe on a cable show, she's got a real problem with her mouth. She thinks that she's being cute when she says stupid words or nasty words or derogatory words. And I guess in some ways she can't help herself because as far as I know, she doesn't claim Christ as Savior. She's not a believer. believer. And, and when a person isn't a Christian, you, you expect them to, to behave like a person who's not a Christian. And they do. But we should. We should be more aware, if we claim Christ as our Savior, then we all need to heed the command and keep a tight rein on our tongues. We need to be more careful in what we say and how we speak. I was laughing today. We stopped by Burger King. <laughs> And Jan and I both deliberated over going through the drive-thru or just going in and get the food. So we surmised that it would be quicker to go inside, actually, and get the food. And so there was a couple in front of me, and evidently they knew the lady behind the counter. And after several minutes of getting acquainted, getting their order in, they, they were asking each other, Well, how's your, how's your child? Well, he's... A lot better than I am, the lady said. Well, how's your husband? Well, he's the mess that he's always been. 
Right. Well, boy, am I glad I came in today. <laughs> and, and see, this, this stuff just flows out. They, they never even think that every statement you've made so far concerning your family has been a negative one. And you wonder why your family struggles. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that none of us, none of us, none of us beginning right here with the little fat guy behind the mic. <laughs> none of us claim perfection. We're far from it. But we all should work at obeying the Lord the best that we can. It's, it's not easy when we, when we come across scriptures that are definite commands. You know, when you're spending time in the Bible, and, and we should work at those commands, and we should ask the Lord for the Lord's grace to understand them, to interpret them properly, and then to apply them to our lives. We, I think as believers, we must make a conscious effort to walk in obedience to the Lord. That's why we call ourselves Christians what the word means Christ like and so we should do the best that we can every day to do that to walk in obedience the second thing is to walk in love we must walk in love the Bible says and again verse 6 says and this is love that we walk in obedience to his commands as you have heard from the beginning his command is that you walk in love we must walk in love. That's a, that's a big command. We must love others. We must love one another. A preacher said in a sermon one time, Lord, I know it's wrong to hate anybody, but if it ever becomes right, I've got the right guy picked out. <laughs> How about you? I bet you have the right guy picked out. The right gal picked out. Uh, get it. Is that an amen or an oh my? <laughs> there will always be people that we don't like, but we're not commanded to like people. We're commanded to love people. And obviously, it's hard to love someone that you don't like. It's much easier to demonstrate love to someone who is nice and lovable and kind and considerate. Those guys, those people, they're easy to love. Sometimes when I'm dealing with the public, I feel a lot like Mark Twain. Mark Twain once said, the more I learn about people, the more I like my dog. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But the command stands true. We must walk in love towards others. And we demonstrate, demonstrate love as best that we can toward all people. The Bible says, as far as it depends on me, that I should live at peace with everyone around me. Doesn't mean that I have to agree with everything they do or say. Doesn't mean that I, I'm just, you know, a pushover. You know, I can, I can have my opinions, I can have my beliefs, I can have all of that. But if I try to force it down your throat, I'm not going to win very, very many friends. There's a saying that I've heard uh, Pastor Rick Warren use many times. I had the opportunity to do a lot of conferences uh, at Saddleback Church out in California. And I've, I've heard him say over and over again that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. And so if you're trying to win somebody to the Lord, if you're trying to share Christ with somebody, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. When you're trying to be a witness to others, it's imperative to remember People don't care about what a friend they have in Jesus until they know what a friend they have in you. Because if you can't build that bridge of relationship between people, 
most likely they're going to miss Jesus somewhere along the way. And the reality is, is you may be the only Jesus they ever see. And it's got to be that personality that builds a bridge and not a wall. Because, you know, there, there are a lot of commands in the Bible. And none of us obey all of them. I see a beginning here. It's, it's more effective to me today. I have this philosophy that I was taught while on staff in my early ministry. And a good friend of mine that brought me into full-time ministry. And, and he was a, a, a great teacher and a great mentor to me. And he, he had this belief that I, he shared with our staff. And I share with you that to be effective in the world today, we become more effective when we earn the right to be heard. Does that make sense? When, when, when you earn the right to be heard, when, when you share with people, when you listen to their stories, when, when you engage with them in a very loving way, they see something. We, we were talking about that this morning, about a couple that was, was here. That, that, that There's something that we have that they don't have. And, and it's not that we're you know, being odd for God because that never does anything. Told you about the guy when I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina. Used to be this guy, you know, guy must have been seven feet tall, as tall as Nathan. And he had this sign that went from his neck down to his ankles that said, Turn or burn. Well, I couldn't wait to go to lunch with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> now he's got a he's got a great message. He's that's a real message. But the way he said it was just so offensive. I, and I was going, come on, man. You're way too tall to have such a, <laughs> an offensive long message on you, you know? There was a story about Moravian missionaries who went to Greenland. And during the first year that they were there, they were unable to make any impression whatsoever. Then came an awful epidemic of smallpox in which multitudes were infected. And the missionaries went about among them ministering to their bodies and their souls in the name of Jesus. After that, the way was clear for them to connect with the people of Greenland. The people said, you have nursed us in our sickness. You have cared for us in distress. You have buried our dead. Now tell us of your religion. When you minister to people in their need, you are loving them. And of course, there are all kinds of ways of expressing love to others. But you demonstrate love best by speaking kindly, by commending the good that they do, by doing a favor by having a listening ear, by sharing in a person's needs. What do you do to love others? What can you do? What will you do? We, we live in tumultuous times. People pro protesting, rioting in the streets. Signs that say black lives matter, all lives matter, blue lives matter. I've yet to see one sign that says Christ lives matter. Because when that happens, there will be no dividing lines between people or races. There will be nothing that divides us. There will be more there that connects us and unites us than there is that divides us. Why? Because Christ's lives matter. Those are the only lives that make a difference in this world. And that's what we're called to live. 
our life in Christ. Matthew 22, verse 36 through 40 says it this way. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. All of the law and the prophets. Everything in the scripture hangs on these two commandments. That's what Jesus said. Love God with everything that's in you and love your neighbor as yourself. The scripture is clear. If we walk with the Lord, then we must love others. The third part of it is that we must also walk in truth. Verse 7 says it this way. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. That we live in obedience, we live in love, we walk in those two things. But John says also you have to walk in truth. You have to accept the truth of the scriptures. You have to be able to discern the spirits. As it said in John chapter 4, test the spirits. Don't just accept everything that comes in the name of God. Because there are many religions that claim connection to God, but it is not the God of the Bible. It is a God that they have created. And whether it's New Age religion or whether it's other religions that have sprung up over the years that claim a connection to God, it's a little G. It's not a capital G. And John says, be careful of that. Have a discernment about you. And the idea is walking in the truth of Christ Many people do not continue in the faith of Christ or the teaching of Christ. We want to mold it and fit it so that it fits us so that we're spiritual. Well, I'm spiritual. <laughs> okay. What does that mean? Do you claim Christ or not? Well, I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. Well, good. Because I hate religion. I don't like religion. Religion gets you nowhere. Relationship gets you everywhere. Including heaven. Religion does nothing. Spirituality, being spiritual, sounds very cool. You know, it's kind of surreal. It's just kind of out there. I'm, I'm one. With the universe. <laughs> That's scary to me. <laughs> I, I want something to latch on to, man. I'm, I'm one with the Lord. I'm one with God. I'm one with Jesus. Yay. I claim Him. Yay. Because when I step into eternity, that little spiritual thing... <laughs> It does nothing. Pfft. How's that working for you? <laughs> there are many, many false teachers in the world. 
who don't believe in the Christ of the Bible. They may believe in some kind of Christ, but not Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. The truth of Christ is the truth of God, and Jesus is still the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through Him. And we must believe it, we must live it, and we must proclaim it. If you ever watch Fox News, you, you notice that there's there's a new host on a, on a show that was called On On the Record, and the guy that hosts the show is a guy that's been with Fox for a long time. His name is Britt Hume, and back in 2009, Britt Hume turned literally turned evangelist while he was appearing on a Fox News Sunday presentation. He was in a segment with panelists predicting the future of Tiger Woods after Woods' notable transgressions, we'll shall say. Hume forecasted that Woods would recover as a golfer, but he said whether he can recover as a person depends on his faith. He's said to be a Buddhist, and I don't think that that faith offers the kind of forgiveness and redemption that is offered by the Christian faith. He goes on to say, so my message to Tiger would be, Tiger, turn to the Christian faith, and you can make a total recovery and be a great example to the world. The next night, Bill O'Reilly interviewed Britt Hume in regard to his statement, and he went on to say even more. The factor invited Hume, uh, Hume to, to uh, elaborate on his remarks. And he says, says this, Tiger Woods is someone I've always rooted for. He, I've always rooted for him as a man and as a golfer. He's paying a frightful price, and my sense is that he has basically lost his family. He needs something that Christianity provides, which is redemption and forgiveness. Jesus Christ offers Tiger Woods something that he badly needs. And if he were to make a true conversion, he would feel the extraordinary blessing. And it would be a magnificent thing to witness. And that's powerful, isn't it? And Hume added that reaction to his suggestion has run the gamut. He said, I got emails from people who are believers like me and said, great, way to go. I've also heard a lot of unfavorable comments from people who say, I'm a pompous jerk who had no business mouthing off on the subject. Hume went on to say that anytime a person mentioned the name of Jesus Christ, that all hell breaks loose. Why is this? Because the world is in the power of the evil one. And it is the world is opposed to Jesus Christ. I appreciate Brett Hume's stand for Christ, even though many people don't like him and, and, and some may even hate him for his stand. But I respect his opinion. I respect his statement. And, and what made Britt Hume's statement so powerful was this. It, it fits with an interview that he had with a Hollywood reporter back in 2008 when he retired from Fox News. He was asked what he'd like to do with his free time. And Hume said, enjoying his family came first. But then he said, I certainly want to pursue my faith more ardently than I have done. I'm not claiming it's impossible to do when you work in this business. I was kind of a nominal Christian for the longest time. But when my son died by suicide in 1998, I came to Christ in a way that was very meaningful to me. If a person is a Christian and tries to face up to the implications of what you say you believe, it's a pretty big thing. If you do it part-time, you're not really living it. 
I would say that we believe like Brett Hume, probably better than many. We believe the truth of Christ and, and we must continue to walk in this truth. It is the truth, the Bible says, that sets you free. To give you the freedom from religion. To be free to have a relationship with Christ and in doing so we have that opportunity to spread the truth. I'll conclude with this. If I'm a bass fisherman and someone says, oh really? Well, let me see your fish. If I have nothing to show, then what I know about bass fishing is speculative at best. Nobody's ever seen me drop a line in the water. You've heard it say, said that we must walk the talk. You know my little saying. Your walk walks and your talk talks. But your walk talks louder than your talk talks. <laughs> it's the idea that, that we must live the faith that we claim to believe. Even though our walk of life isn't always perfect. I can promise you mine's not. I struggle. I don't have it all together. If I'm breathing, I'm probably going to make a mistake. Well, I can guarantee you. <laughs> <laughs> no problem to do it. But we must live what we believe every day by doing the very best that we can to walk in obedience to walk in love, to walk in truth. And I believe the Bible promises that if we will do that, like John said, that our joy, our joy will be complete. That's what I want. I want my joy to be complete. I don't want to just be happy. I love being happy. But that joy that the Bible talks about is something that nothing or no one can take away from you. And it is infectious. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for your word. We ask you today to help us, Father, through your grace applied to our lives. Help us to walk in obedience. To help us to, to walk in love and to walk in truth. Help, that, help us to apply that to our lives on a daily basis. Let that be the mantra that we live on our lives in relationship to you. We thank you, Father. Thank you again for giving us this opportunity to come together. Thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for giving us a place to be able to share your word. Now help us to live it. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming. God bless you. Yeah, I mean, he was running away. I don't know. Yeah, I'm going to check.